So we have talked about the marketplace, uh, the workers, and now we want to look at the destination sites which are starting to drive uh, the traffic that is transforming local on-demand services. Uh, of course, Uber is the, the hallmark of that business, uh, having proved the model uh, across the board uh, in driving and now delivery and other services that you're getting into. Um, home Advisor is an aggregator of traffic and referrals for home uh, uh, repair and services businesses and uh, based in uh, Denver. Uh, their site, in a lot of ways, looks like a magazine. It's a place where you go to learn about, as well as uh, shop for assistance in, in uh, on-demand services for the home. And finally, with MasterCard, uh, MasterCard is the underpinning of a financial system. Um, if you look at the size and breadth of, of the transactions that they're able to analyze and help people with, uh, they are potentially the glue to start to pull together some of these disparate services and bring them into relationship so that not only can you think about, for instance, uh, where you might want your dinner delivered from, but what could come along with it. And uh, those preferences are things that we often need to be uh, uh, cued to ask for in our, in our thinking. And so using that kind of data to start to enrich the environment is an important uh, thing to be thinking about going forward. Brooke, I wanted to start with you, and the microphone's right there. Um, now, Uber obviously uh, is uh, a global entity at this point, but you take a very regional approach to thinking about and developing the services that you deliver. So you have, essentially, you're CEO of the Northwest. Yeah, we do. So Uber decided pretty early on um, to double down on having local teams built out. So while we have, you know, our core, our, our largest office is in San Francisco. Uh, we do have city teams and regional teams all around the world uh, that manage the local business to to address what a, the local city needs, what the local region needs. Uh, so here in Seattle, we run the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we get to dictate which programs come into our cities, when they launch, uh, what kind of marketing activities we want to engage in, um, and we also engage on the political and communications level. And so you really get to decide, uh, you have a lot of decision-making power on the local level, and that's something that Travis has been a deep believer in, and I think it's been very unique to Uber, and it has allowed us to change the brand and change our platform depending on the needs of the given city. So uh, drivers are, are relying on, on Uber for the transaction processing, for the discovery of the ride, and so forth. Um, how are you, uh, how do you think about designing a system that engages and retains people? Because of course, driver retention is just as challenging as customer retention in many cases. Uh, this is an area where, uh, you know, the, the reported uh, uh, Numbers are that like 60% of Uber drivers think about leaving every year, but that's also true of small business. M many people come and go from small business very rapidly. How do you encourage them with the tools you're building to stay engaged and deepen that investment in being the local driver? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a huge diversity in drivers. When I, f when I first started at Uber over three years ago, the platform wasn't very diverse. Drivers predominantly uh, were on full-time um, and it was their, their long-term career. There was almost no women on the platform. I think we had two total. Uh, now we're at about 15% women. The platform is extremely diverse. And you know, I think we're actually coming where we want people to be on the platform for short periods of time if that meets their needs. So let's say you were laid off yesterday um, and you need to make sure that you can make ends meet and you need to make rent and you need to buy groceries and you need to support your family. Uh, but your end goal is actually to go back into the the trade that you're used to and that you're trained for. Uh, we see that as okay that they come in. Uh, teachers are another great example. You know, they will come on the platform only for the summer and they will come back every summer. Uh, but they do, you know, quote unquote, churn off the platform for nine months of the year, uh, and we're very supportive of that. But fundamentally, I think. Being on the platform, we want to, we want to make sure it's safe for drivers. We want to make sure that drivers um, have the ability and access to fast support. So we do have a partner support center on the ground, actually just a couple blocks from here in Seattle. Uh, we want to make sure that they can communicate with us. So there is an emergency phone line um, should there be any kind of 
emergency that they interact with in the, on the platform. Um, and we want to make sure that riders and drivers both produce a very respectful environment between the two. Um, and so that those are the commitments that we give to drivers to make sure that they're happy and stay on the platform. And so, Adam, with, with Home Advisor, you've made investments in software that helps people actually manage those small businesses. And we're talking about people who do everything from lawn mowing to fence repair to building a new porch. Um, why did you make an investment in, in business management tools? Was that a key to your being able to re, uh, retain people? That's a great question. So I think uh, what Mitch is referring to is we bought a company called M Help Desk uh, about a year and a half ago. They're based in DC, an early leader in, in what's a burgeoning market of field service management software, so back-end software for, for these businesses. And it feels inevitable. We did focus groups with these guys. And although any of us uh, are early adopters of technology, and if we had a contracting business, of course, would manage our schedule digitally, right? Of course, would. Uh, send digital and professional estimates. Um, we did some focus groups with contractors, and when you showed them this software, it was like their eyes lit up and they saw that this was the future. Um, albeit moving in a, a more slow direction than, than any of us would, would expect, but that's what you deal with with small business. I think we do see it, to go back to your question, you know, we do see it as ultimately a tool that helps them provide better service to our customers. If you have a contractor that shows up reliably on time, that you know, um, acquits themselves pro professionally to that customer, Ultimately, it's a better experience for our customer. Um, the, if those customers do more jobs with those providers, they retain on our platform longer. So that's that's absolutely the, the strategy. And, and Dave, as you, you look at the, this whole environment from the perspective of enabling financial services, uh, and obviously MasterCard knows that small businesses come and go and churn very rapidly through their own industries. Uh, what kind of advice are you giving to destination sites that are, uh, uh, that are aggregating both the demand and the supply uh, in order to help them be effective uh, for both of those customers? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, so we started a team in Silicon Valley about three years ago um, solely focused on building relationships with digital companies. Um, and not just e-commerce companies, transacting companies. And you can transact in a lot of different ways, whether it's a subscription or buying something or putting a card on file for a service. Um, so we built out a pretty big platform of companies that we work with in Silicon Valley. Our headquarters are in Purchase, New York. I've been twice in the entire time I've worked for the company. Uh, I'm not a payments guy, per se. I was hired specifically because I've uh, spent most of my career in, in consumer internet and, and our job is to actually build relationships with companies in the transacting space, just digital, um, and, and one, educate them on the services and products that we provide or our partners provide, um, but more importantly, finding unique ways of working with them. So uh, marketplace companies for us are really exciting uh, transaction opportunities because you've got a whole ton of money coming in the front door, uh, lots of small transactions. Um, majority of it is all credit card based. Um, and then you've got 85% of the dollars going out the back door uh, to drivers and service providers and things like that. Um, a lot, and so we looked at it, you know, like, like hey, there's a lot of action here. Um, we, you know, most of that money is gonna go across uh, traditional rails like MasterCard rails. Um, so what we've done over the last couple of years is one, try to build better relationships with companies like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. Um, on the marketing side, on the brand side, but then try and be consultative with them and help them on things like um, fraud as they start to grow uh, overseas. And so a lot of companies that are US based, once they start to, to grow internationally, their fraud rate goes up to like 30% in some mm -hmm. instances. Uh, declines goes up too, right? And most of those declines are false positives. Um, in that they probably should have been accepted, but some red flag came off. Um, and banks are not necessarily um, encouraged to fix declines. They're okay with the, they're okay with declines, right? Because for them, it's risk management. Mm -hmm. For us, if we can help somebody like Uber um, in a foreign country um, reduce declines by 10%, that's potentially hundreds of millions of dollars moving across the rails. So, so we'll go in and provide those services free. We just work with them on a consulting basis, good for them, and it's good for us. And, well. and living on the transaction revenue that you normally would. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We make, we make our money um, predominantly on network fees. Um, we, we do provide, um, we have some products we sell, data services and things like that, but, but a lot of our, our partnerships are really based on marketing and we invest in companies. And so we've spent a lot of money investing 
uh, in our relationship with Uber and Lyft and, and other marketplace companies because we, you know, Uber's now a top 100 merchant of the world. And if you don't have a relationship with them as a network provider, you're not doing a job. So let's talk about the consumer side and the offer to the consumers. Uh, obviously, for Uber, it's getting on somebody's phone is the first and most important step. Is the site uh, a part of your marketing outreach at this point, or is it almost automatic that people go right to your app and start there? I mean, the, the app is definitely the, the central place where most people interact with our brand. Uh, we definitely put time and energy into our brand and our website, but the, the app is people people go straight to download. So how would you characterize the consumer promise Uber makes? It's very simple, is that it's reliable transportation available for you 24-7 at any time. And as we expand our services, we hope to provide pretty much anything you want within just a couple of minutes. So low ETAs, uh, reliable ride, uh, transparent pricing, um, and really, really simplistic, a very simplistic experience. I think that was really the magic of Uber at the beginning is just being able to push a button, get in a car, and simply get out. Now we're all very, very used to it, but when that first came out, it was quite revolutionary. It was stunning. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, Adam, how would you characterize what you tell people about the people you supply on Home Advisor? As a consumer, what what am I expecting when I come to come to you? That's a great question. So I think um, you know if any of you have ever tried to hire a contractor before, you've experienced a lot of the pain points. And uh, one is around safety. So in our case, we screen all of our contractors. We throw out about 15 or 20 percent who still want to pay and get on our platform, even though we've told them we're going to background check them, and, and they get they fail that anyway. Um, the other piece is availability, right? So it's, it's safety, it's availability. If you've ever tried calling down a traditional directory of uh, service providers, most of these guys, they're not available, they're booked out, they don't pick up their phone, they don't service your area of town. Um, we solve all of that, right? So we promise a consumer you're going to be getting a reliable and safe and trusted pro, and they're going to be available, and you're going to be able to connect with them within minutes and get your job done. So convenience and simplicity right. for both of you is really essential, and obviously MasterCard is lowering the barrier to a transaction, for <coughs> instance, by being uh, having the card on file and that sort of thing. Um, what's the key to recurring revenue with an with a consumer visiting Home Advisor, for instance? Yeah, well, I think we're a little jealous of, of companies like Uber that have a naturally uh, m more of a high frequency type event. So for us, the challenge is being top of mind with what's inherently a low frequency event, right? You may need to hire a contractor only three, four, five times a year. And it's just about delivering, like Uber, a wow experience um, on what's traditionally been a painful or annoying experience, you know, in hiring a cab and having to get money out of your pocket. In this case, hiring a contractor and dealing with someone who's, who's unreliable and not showing up. I think if you can deliver a wow experience there, people will remember and come back. And that's what we're seeing. And for Uber, you're actually thinking about expanding into other forms of convenient mobility. Yeah, I think there's kind of two, actually there's three branches of expansion that we're engaging in. Is one is becoming a reliable ride outside of your metropolitan area. So we're in Spokane, we're in Bellingham, we're in Boise, um, being able to rely on our platform outside of your city core. Within a city core, it's about making things more efficient. So doing things like forward dispatch and enabling the driver to accept a ride before they end their last ride to enable them to make additional money and more income, um, but also putting more people in the same vehicle, so things like Uber Pool or Seattle is the pilot city for Uber Hop, which is a point-to-point -point service. And then the third branch is expanding into other services, so the Uber Eats, Uber Rush. Now talk a little more about Uber Hop. How does, what is a point-to-point -point service as compared to the way we think of Uber today? Sure. So it, let's say you live in Lower Queen Anne and you typically commute into downtown Seattle um, on a daily basis, Uber Hop runs from about 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning. You open up your app, you select Hop, it will actually provide you with walking directions uh, to where you would pick up that vehicle. The first person to request actually initiates the Uber Hop, and then it will leave 15 minutes after that original initiation. So you go, you sit in the vehicle, uh, other people will get in, and then it drops you off at a designated point, which is right now uh, on First and University. Microsoft connector for everyone. Exactly. <laughs> Some ways. Interesting. Uh, now, Dave, as you look at, at, at all of the logistics that you can look into through Uber or HomeAdvisor's uh, relationship with a homeowner, you, MasterCard provides a lot of data about what might be the next thing a person would be inclined to do after spending money on a trip or on a fence. How, how are you increasing the exposure of that and doing it in a way that's going to make the customers 
feel as confident as the providers of services? Um, well, ho hopefully it's um, in the background of the customer. Most of our customer data is on anonymized, so there's no PII. We're not actually t sending a profile on what you and where you spend your money to, but we're sending cohort sizes. So um, um, you're right. So, so we have access to you know billions of dollars worth of transaction. We processed four trillion dollars last year. We processed about six billion dollars an hour. Um, um, for a lot of partners, they have a really good segmentation of what their customers do. They know what they do when they're in their Uber car, and they, but what they don't know is what they do before and after they get in and out of their Ubers. And so we can actually segment a database of a customer like Uber, and we can say, oh, you know, this is what your customers do. This is where they spend their money. And, and there's a couple of things they can do with that. One, they can segment their database to better understand how their, their customers spend their money. They can use that for marketing. Uh, they can use that for partnerships. You know, if, they're, if their customers over-index for QSRs, um, go do more QSR partnerships, right? Because you, you've got a great demo that you can sell. Um, you can also use that for customer acquisition. So we actually can sell cohort sizes. You can buy them on the open market through DSPs. And so if they want to say, hey, this is the profile of our customer. We can actually go buy more customers like that on the open marketplace. And we have a number of partners like Blue Kai and Exalate, stuff like that. We can just go buy a, buy a CPM. And, and if there are questions, we will have Mike and the mobile microphone. Um, so now uh, going to, you mentioned this a moment ago, you're, you're leaving the, the central cities in a lot of ways and starting to look at smaller communities. Uh, I happen to live 50 miles south of here and I've been watching on my Uber app as more cars appear. And I would think home advisors business would not be so much urban as suburban. Are, is the future of, of a lot of this stuff really going to t start to spread out from where we assume it is taken hold today into the suburbs? And how do you see developing that at Home Advisor? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, definitely urban and, and particularly suburban, as you mentioned, right? It's, for us, it's wherever there's density of, of home ownership and um, having a, uh, a larger house obviously equals more uh, more jobs on our platform. So, yeah, suburban is our strength. Um, you know, we see demand in rural markets, too. I think the challenge there, like any marketplace, is just supply and demand, right? And, um, you know, we're starting to see that that spread, but that's always going to be the challenge. I think our strength will always be in population centers, I'm guessing, like like any market local marketplace. Population centers, though, that are... are, are clustered around a, a, a center, but perhaps full right. of many centers. That, that, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. I mean, for us, and again, it's, it's probably different than, than Brooke for you guys at, at Uber, um, but we would, for example, New York, number one population market, is not our number one market, right? Because it's a lot of renters. Um, we do, we over-index in places like Denver, where we're from, uh, Dallas, places like that, uh, the DC metro area. Um, so I think it's a little bit different for us with, with home ownership. And, and in terms of, of conquering suburbia. Um, how do you see Uber moving into those areas? Is the is the ride the first big step, or is something like Eats more of a, a, a spear point for you? I mean, I think right now it is it is the ride, So, but it's going to be less frequent rides. It's going to be trips to the airport, um, definitely areas that see influx of tourism during certain seasons. Uh, but the beauty of the platform, because there are no set hours that a driver has to be on the platform, um, it, in these rural areas, most of the drivers, uh, many of them are actually at home. Um, so I had someone pick me up who was actually on their way to the grocery store when I was down in Vancouver, Washington a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't, you know, in downtown Seattle, you'll receive back-to-back -back trips on the platform, but in somewhere like Spokane or Vancouver, it will be less frequent because it's less dense. Um, but because of that flexibility, you can literally be sitting at home watching TV, you can be at a cafe studying, and turn on your app and have the potential of earning income. I do think potentials like Eats um, and Rush also have some, some potential there. There's actually someone in Spokane, there's a tire shop that uses us to actually transport tires across the city. Even though we actually haven't officially launched the Rush program there, they find UberX more affordable um, than hiring a truck and having using that to move their goods across the city. So people are already being creative in these smaller cities with the platform and with UberX. And does that, that require more information about the supplier? Like they have a pickup truck? 
for, for instance, for the, wheel, the tires? You know, we haven't extended into pickup trucks in any of the markets that I'm in, uh, but there we do have our XL option, mm -hmm. which is typically a six-seater, so it does have a larger capacity. And so there are options already out there that are not built specifically for transporting goods, um, but many people find a way. Uh, do we have questions? Just want to not ignore the audience. So now, Dave, as you look at, at the... Uh, the evolution of, of, of this on-demand and its migration from city centers into more of the rest of where most of us live. Um, is MasterCard looking also at enabling more people to be solopreneurs uh, and starting to provide services that they could use to tie in to a home advisor if they are a plumber or into Uber if they're thinking about... It seems like you guys could be the glue that links a lot of this stuff together. So, so we could be. I think we made a conscious decision to really stay in the background. Okay. Um, and there's a number of reasons why we do that. One, it keeps the overhead of our company down. Uh, we have less than 10,000 employees on a global basis. So we're a relatively small company. Um, we don't have any customer service. There's, there, we, don't have, we don't have any consumers calling us for anything. If you have a problem with your bank, you call your bank. Nobody calls us, so it's great. Um, um, it, there's also this concept of we, we like the idea of being very neutral. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have purposely not invested in companies um, so we wouldn't be perceived of having a bias in the marketplace. Um, we don't do any investing in consumer plays. Anything I look at for an investment is, all, is B2B and FinTech. Um, we don't buy cons consumer stuff. Um, now what we will do is we will actually tie in our partners that want to work together. So I have uh, a partnership with Pinterest where I've done a bunch of stuff with them on their Bible pins. Um, we have a great relationship with Nima Marcus. Um, so I was launching this great promotion with Pinterest over the holidays. It went very, very well. If you use your MasterCard, you got $20 credit. Right, so it was a great promotion. We, we sold a, a bunch of them. Nima Marcus actually called us up and they said, hey, we love Pinterest. We, we like being on Pinterest. We want to do something with Pinterest. Can you guys help us set up a deal where you know, we participate? And we're like, sure. And so you know, we got the Nima Marcus team together and the Pinterest team together. And we sort of brokered a little partnership. We threw in a little dough to make it interesting. Um, and then they're going to launch that relatively soon. So we'd like to sort of be uh, an enabler. And the, and the best way to be that is to be relatively neutral in the marketplace. So, for example, we actually have a relatively good relationship with both Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. um, because we haven't overextended ourselves with one company at the expense of the other. So now let's talk about the supply side. And uh, now you've described an environment where this is part of how somebody makes a living in many cases. Um, as Uber thinks about other aspects of what it can do with its maps and cars and other services that it can tie together, how do you see perhaps increasing your share of supplier as a, as a, a, a mode of growing your business? Are you looking at other ways you can facilitate these people making money from their community? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, David spoke earlier, um, the Eats platform is using the same supply base. Uh, we are also looking at ways of putting more people on the same vehicle, um, looking at ways of doing strategic partnerships with local governments and cities um, to help actually connect people to public transportation to make the supply more efficient. Um, and I do think as well as that we always encourage uh, the people that are on our platform, or and definitely don't suppress it, their ability to kind of multi-app, use, have multiple streams of income. So you maybe you might have someone that drives on the Uber platform, but they'll also deliver food uh, in the evenings on the Postmates app. Uh, we also have about 300 identified small businesses operating on our platform um, outside of a transportation service provider or food delivery service provider. So they own restaurants around town, they own clothing stores, they own jewelry shops. Um, and so really enabling them and supporting them to grow their small businesses within the communities that we live um, and operate in is, is another initiative that we've been working very deeply with to help support them grow their other businesses, even if they're off the platform. So Adam, same question essentially for HomeAdvisor, but are there other ways that HomeAdvisor could create connections between businesses in the community? Uh, maybe even a HomeAdvisor center where people could go in and uh, 
plan their home, for instance. Sure, yeah, um, it's something we, we're always looking at, right? How can we create deeper connections between homeowner and contractor and then among contractors? Um, and, and, you know, one, one idea that, that we've had and are always thinking about um, is, you know, there's a need for GCs to find subs even. Right, so we've always connected the, the, the two sides of the platform. Can we even do connections within one side? And similarly, you can imagine things on the, the, the homeowner side. Um, I think you know another thing that, that we've done, though, is really trying to extract data from the platform to help both sides be more informed. So a good example of this is we launched our true cost guide a couple of years ago. It's the, the largest database of localized project costs. And that actually, we, we get great reception on that from both consumers and contractors because it helps facilitate a deeper conversation and more informed conversation between both. Um, so I think that's an example of, uh, of that. One of the things that we're projecting as we look at the evolution of this market is that central um, business retail space is going to be less important to a lot of people. And potentially creating meeting spaces or gathering places where people could meet for a ride but sit in comfort while they were waiting for a ride. Uh, these kinds of things are also going to uh, uh, be opportunities for uh, more partners. Uh, particularly people who own real estate looking for new things to do with it. How can um, companies with, that take a logistic, logistical view of the world start to, to seed that kind of a new business model in central business areas that may be struggling because they're changing from destinations to places that are providing service into the home or into the neighborhood? Have you thought about that kind of stuff? We, we haven't, honestly, in, in terms of, uh, we're always, have always been a business where the provider comes to you. So we've always been very removed from a place-based location. It's actually, we, we feel like we're very well situated for that in, in terms of partnerships and, and logistics, because right now a lot of uh, publishers online and, and have been geared towards a place-based economy, right? You think about a directory and, and within even a search, uh, a typical search engine results where they show a list of plumbers that are in their vicinity to you for their office location. That's irrelevant. And we've long been saying that. So actually, we're excited to see everyone's platform move towards more of a uh, on-demand uh, uh, location agnostic uh, type of situation. And I'd ask you the same, but also, can people look at Uber as potentially a way of planning where they're going to meet or, or come together because they're, uh, you know, I might be looking at having dinner delivered, but then I find out two of my friends are at a restaurant nearby. Wouldn't I be wouldn't I rather go eat with them? Yeah, I mean, currently you can you can share your ETA or your location, obviously, but we we aren't in a place where we're prepared to share those locations without someone um, okay. opting into it. Um, and it really, are it's very dictated by the individuals, right? By the people in a city where they're hanging out, where they're going. Rather, I don't feel like we dictate where they should go, and it's sure. much more about them dictating where they want to go. But I do think that kind of shared space. Uh, shared workspace like we're sitting in today, um, waiting spaces, gathering spaces. I know Starbucks is doing a lot on that side um, to really make some of their uh, cafes much more of a meeting space and a gathering space. And I think that, that that is very positive for us and the growth of those is is fantastic. We all know that when you set that surge notification and you want it to go down, having a comfortable place to wait out of the rain um, is wonderful and you can socialize with your friends rather than waiting, waiting on the street corner. So we're very supportive of those kind of shared and new spaces that the communities can can join in on. I did go to a recruiting event here in Seattle when the, the new office opened, and one of your uh, execs described Uber dating. Uh, you know, it's this idea that you would get in the car single and get out as a couple. Uh, and, and having been on the founding board of directors of Match.com, this made six cents to me. Uh, so uh, that... That kind of intimacy with the customer is something that MasterCard, over the course of many decades, has figured out how to, to, to help people opt in and, and kind of hint them towards those things. Uh, yeah. Is I mean, that so, so, I mean, we're doing a little bit of work like that with a couple of e-commerce partners. We have a, a really big partner that's all e-commerce, um, and they're actually exploring now, like other e-commerce players, um, building uh, online store locations. And so they opened three on a whim, um, doing very, very well. Um, it fits their model really well because they don't have to take inventory there. They've got, it's more of a display thing. It's got a look and feel that they dig. You can order product there right. and have it delivered. So it's a different type of showrooming. Um, there's a lot of real estate available, uh, as you know. Um, and so we help them actually um, segment their, their audience where 
we let them know where they spend their money when they're not shopping on their site. Mm -hmm. And so then we help them with a real estate overlay of saying, you know, we picked like five or six stores that they over index for, um, predominantly women. Um, and um, we help them actually map out 24 locations to build, uh, build their stores based on um, the other stores in the area where their customers have a preference. So it's a little creepy, but but um, <laughs> but nobody's like you know PII was used, and it's just basically you know anonymous purchase data that sure. that they're going to use um, in a very very targeted way. It it can be a little creepy, but we get used to it, which was Robert's point this morning uh, about how much this is changing and his idea of the concierge economy, this sort of notion that not only. Uh, are we watching? But we really know some things that you're going to want. And you know, Home Advisor, as you move from one stage of home ownership to another, or you have kids and you think now I need a pool, those kinds of things are all uh, part of the marketing that uh, a destination site really supports. Uh, do you see as Home Advisor grows that it becomes more like home and garden in some ways? Good question. Um, in terms of home care, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we definitely at per media. Yeah, media. Um, you know, I I don't I don't think so. Honestly, I think we, we think of ourselves as much more of a of a transactional platform with media to to support and facilitate those transactions. And what I mean by that is again, our, our true cost guide um, is an example of this, right? Historically, when you're engaging in that transaction with a contractor, you're going to have that conversation about how much is this going to cost. So if we can provide that content. That's great. And you can imagine throughout that typical transaction, other types of questions that might come up that we could build content for. But I don't, I, I mean, we've looked at this a lot. We, we partner with inspirational sites like Better Homes and Gardens it's been a long-term partner of ours. Um, but I think that's better left to some of the other magazines and we can partner with and kind of be that transactional engine versus actually being in the magazine ourselves. And I, again, kind of the same question for Uber, but Uber is about places and, and being part of a, a, a large, community and and tapping into rich parts of that community you may not have been aware of before do you see surfacing more and more of that kind of information as you get into these uh, secondary and, and tertiary markets where food delivery is just one more step of your relationship with a, an individual yeah absolutely and I, I think it's based uh, and I hope I hope that it continues to be that where where it's based on what the customer actually wants or does or what our our riders, our drivers actually engage in in the community rather than an actual like advertising platform. Like today, for example, we have a partnership with Amtrak and with our city team down in Portland uh, where a driver was able to pick the kind of their perfect day and supply recommendations to their favorite hotspots within town. And it, it, even though those those businesses that we featured in our email and our blog today, those were not paid for. They were organic, kind of real spaces mm -hmm. um, that people love going to. And and I also think that personalization, like th this is not going to be launching next week or anything like that. But I do see Uber in the future as you know when I get come out come out from my apartment each morning, the car is there ready waiting for me and has my favorite cup of coffee already already there and 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 so kind of some of that predictive uh, and personalization aspect of it I think we will integrate deeper and further with that well we have run up against the end of our time thank you very much uh, panelists and thank you for joining us today next we're going to have Mike Boland um, <laughs>